Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Unfiltered production. Today, we have a very special guest. Yes, Dr. Jason Falvey. He's been with us before, and he always gives us a reality check when we see interesting studies that are out there. And also, Cindy Kraft, my business partner, is with me. And if you guys can see the screen, you'll see that Jason's Twitter handle is on his on his uh, screen. Please follow him on Twitter. Um, he's not just a great guy with a great personality and, and fun to follow. He also follow, has some really interesting um, information that he puts out, especially surrounding Medicare care in the post-acute setting, especially uh, skilled nursing facilities recently in home health. Jason is a former home health uh, physical therapist for years. So he he's walked the talk and um, it's super important. And we just rely on Jason so much. Um, what, what we're talking about today is the article that came out in JAMA on um, April 10th of this year. And basically it was claims based versus agency that they were comparing. And it was a large sample and it was all done from 2013 to 2019. So when I reread the study today, it jumped off the page to me for the first time that this was all pre PDGM data. PDGM is everybody just as a reminder started on January 1st, 2020. And we were working in PDGM for a solid two and a half months or three months until the pandemic hit. Um, so a lot of the data that, that has come out post PDGM is always tainted with, well, this is pandemic data. So what I liked about the data that was in this study was that it was all pre PDGM. It mo most of it was with a wrap and it all kind of focuses on the stars ratings that started in 2015. So really there's, there's three years of pre star rating data and four years of post star rating data in the study. Um, but I am not an expert when it comes to these type of studies, neither is Cindy. We look at more of what happens in your agency on a day-to-day -day basis. So one of the things I wanted to do today is ask Dr. Falvey a very important question. Very important question. Is this a valid study? What did you think about this study the first time you looked at it? Oh, all right. So first, I'm excited to be here. Super <laughs> excited to be here. And so thanks for having me. It's always, it's always fun to come and get a chance to chat with you guys. Um, okay, so the study, like, first, I look at the authorship team, you know, Dave Grabowski, the senior author here, he's a very big in the health policy world, right, he sits on MedPAC, and so he clearly has a lot of experience doing this kind of work in, in skilled nursing facility and home health agencies. They have access to 100% Medicare data, so that's you know, confidence building in and of itself, but data is what it is, right? Like you can do perfect statistical interpretation on data, but there's some clinical nuances to like how that data is generated that really set up the value, right? And so in their defense, they're just analyzing things like the same things that Medicare would have, like right? analyzing it with zero clinical interpretation, which I think we've all discussed as is problematic in, in a lot of ways. Um, but using that data, they, you know, I want to highlight that they found some really promising trends. We're getting better at managing people's functions, right? If I just look at one top line finding is functional improvement scores are getting better over time from 2013 to 2019. Like people's functional improvement is good. Patients care about function more than they care about, you know, extending their lifespan. And you look at the literature, you know, people get to choose. I get to take this pill that will extend my life but it will make me, you know, functionally, severely functionally impaired, they're going to not take that treatment very much, you know, foregoing life-saving treatment so they can, you know, improve their function. And so patients prioritize function and cognition more. So why shouldn't we first celebrate that people are improving in function to a greater degree, right? Now, the genesis of that, is it a, you know, a real improvement in function versus is it a measurement you know, error, we'll say, is the, the, the difference in interpretation, right? I could look at that study and say, I'm really impressed that we're focusing more on function. We're getting therapy involved and integrating mobility into these care plans, right? I could interpret it like that as a physical therapist. And there's probably some elements of that in the data. But we all know that there's elements of you pay people based on functional improvement. Functional improvement will get better on paper, regardless if that is the reality or not, right? If you're if you're forcing agencies to show that as a as a star rating tool or, or paying them based on performance and value-based purchasing, those are those are things that 
you know, are going to happen. They're going to be a creep up in those measurements. And whether that's, you know, attention on making sure you document people's impairments really cleanly at the start of care, right? Kind of a, a more attention versus, you know, the small number of agencies who outright game the numbers. Um, and I, I want to think that that's a very small handful of bad actors. And I, I'm hoping it's a, a very small minority, but you guys know better than me with boots on the ground there. Um, but I think there's some element of both. So I don't think we should just immediately discount the fact that, you know, these findings were mixed. I think we should first say people's function is getting better. And while some of that's measurement error, I have a hard time thinking that all of that is, you know, measurement error and indefensible from the clinical record. So we should first be celebrating that before we even move on to anything else. If mobility matters to patients, it matters to us as clinicians, and it's getting better. So, yeah, yes. Okay, well, go ahead, Sid. But, but Jason, this is why anytime we come across a, a, any research or anything, um, either I go to Sherry or Sherry comes to me with, we got to talk to Jason. Mm -hmm. Okay, because there can be a very visceral reaction to some of that and knowing that you've looked at it from your experience position to say, you know, it, 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 it's a reasonable study. It's not something wackadoodle off the wall, they, you know, only use two charts kind of thing. But I think their connection to the function got better, but rehospitalization didn't change. I have to say, I, I am very guilty of making that quick connection as well. Um, yeah. Having been part of the original technical expert panel for value-based purchasing in the early days of the demonstration when they first started producing data, that just struck me from the slide deck alone, is your demonstration states are saying that they're improving function at a better rate than non-participating states. But at the same time, their hospitalization and ED use is no different. So that connection to if we're getting function that much better, is it reasonable to expect a direct connection to reducing rates of them going back in the hospital? Because I know you've done a lot of research about rehospitalization and, and factors around that. Is it really fair to say function getting better should drop rehospitalization rates? Yeah, I mean, so that's on a population scale, higher levels of physical function should be protective against hospitalization. But those effects, aren't always immediate, right? Like improving somebody's function might not always be physiological, right? Like if I'm gonna improve somebody's muscle mass and aerobic capacity, sure, they should be hospitalized less, but I could also pull functional improvement levers by you know, getting them the right equipment and training the caregivers or setting up their home environment for them to be more independent. And all of a sudden I've changed their function, I've changed their independence. They don't now, they don't need a human assistance to do something, but I didn't really change their physical capacity because I saw them for 17 days, right? And I'm a really good therapist, I would like to think, but I'm not changing somebody's muscle mass in 17 days. I'm not changing their VO2 max in 17 days. I'm not changing their capillary density or their mitochondrial density or their cerebral blood flow or their, you know, changing their peripheral vascular disease and improving their exercise tolerance, you know, I, I, I'm good, but I'm not that good, right? So a lot of the functional improvements we make as home care therapists are because we're really good at pulling the other levers, the home environment, the caregiver training, the helping people set up the environment for success. That doesn't necessarily translate into a lot of less hospitalizations, right? If you're going to get pneumonia, you're going to get pneumonia with a tub bench or without a tub bench or with grab bars or without grab bars. Like grab bars aren't preventative of pneumonia in 17 days. So I think that this is an, one interpretation of the data is um, you're gaming the system. You're pushing the, the levers to improve function because you're getting paid on that, but you're not really improving people's health. I might also interpret that as agencies now feel like they have the skills to take on more medically complex and more frail patients and still move the needle on their function. And then just because they're taking on more complex patients, they're slightly 0.39% increase in hospitalization rate per year. But maybe if you didn't have functional improvement as a big focus in value-based purchasing, maybe that rate would have been higher. Maybe this is actually a good thing. Like that's one interpretation is we're taking more medically complex patients in ways that are not measured well by OASIS or claims, right? Frailty, not particularly well measured in claims or OASIS, 
but hugely important, right? If we look at the data on frailty or mild cognitive impairment from other settings, like home care is taking on more and more complex patients or more patients with social needs that are not well captured. Um, we're, we're bridging to 99% of zip code. We have, you know, we have a footprint in almost every area of the country. So of course we're, we're gonna have patients that have needs that are not being well measured on, on these tools. And we might be doing a really good job protecting them on average, right? That's another interpretation. And I think the true the truth is probably somewhere in between. There's some gaming, but there's also some, you know, interpretation over the last 10 years about the value of PT that we've been beating this drum and the importance of function as a what matters most for older adults and prioritizing function as a major care plan and not just a sideshow of treating multimorbidity. So you know, I, I want to not, I don't like to use the word lazy interpretation, right? The perfectly accurate interpretation to say increasing hospitalizations with increasing function is a mismatch that, you know, doesn't match, you know, our expectations. True, but I don't think that's the full story. And I think the other interpretation is we're getting more complex patients and we know how to improve their function because our tools are getting better and our, our, our models of care are being more refined. And we just happen to have an overflow in hospitalizations because those patients are sicker. That, that's a reasonable interpretation too. And my question for you is, is if, when I read this it, article to me, when, when I, my, my definition of Seminole not being a researcher is that it's an article or a study that can, that can springboard additional studies that are more specific to some of the issues in this that have been identified in this study. Do you see that as a researcher that this could be one of those types of articles? Or yeah. Studies? yeah, absolutely. There'd be a real easy way to do this, right? I'm a researcher. I just get a cohort of people that are in home health care that's randomly distributed, and I measure their function in an objective way that isn't games, right? And I have zero financial incentive to make somebody's tug score or gate speed or SPPV or whatever I decide to use. I have zero incentive to make that better as a researcher. I just study it and look at those correlations and the mismatches. What I would probably see is some agencies, those things line up really well. Their functional improvement lines up with functional improvement I saw, right? Or life space mobility, like they get out in the community and they can do more stuff. Um, you know, the disability levels, like OASIS, the disability measures that are in OASIS, not really, not really a, a scale that I would teach students to use as a valid and reliable measure of somebody's function. And knowing how it was developed and the statistical, the, the statistical methods that were used to drive it kind of void of clinical interpretation um, in the original, you know, OASIS. And I met the person who did the statistical validation of the original functional scores. Very nice man, not a physical therapist, not a geriatrician, a very good statistician. Um, so when those tools are developed void of clinical input, it really makes it hard to say, are we measuring what we actually think we're measuring, right? So of course, agencies are just going to game what they see because, you know, that's, it's, it's kind of disconnected from patients' actual function and they just feel like, you know, no one's going to really know and they're probably right. And, and it's interesting to watch CMS evolve, right? It's interesting to watch them evolve as someone who's been in the home health space since, as Cindy put it today very kindly, ye old pencil and paper days or better known as pre-OASIS days, right? Before the OASIS data set was being even, that, that data was even being collected. And thank you for saying what you said about it not being tied to the actual full picture of the patient. Because we tell people all the time, constantly, it is a data tool, it is a data collection tool. All that stuff you do in between, all those uh, evidence-based measures that you mentioned for physical therapy, all the evidence-based measures for nursing, all of the assessments and the in the treatments is what occurs between and that's where your quality really lies between those oasis data, data points and I, I, this a couple of things jumped off the page with this me jason and hopefully you maybe maybe you can put them to bed one is that MedPAC, who every year recommends a cut to home health reimbursement no matter what it wouldn't matter it wouldn't matter the scenario i think MedPAC would probably recommend a cut for home health they came in and they basically don't look at the functional items anymore. What do you think that they've pivoted to, to make what, what we know what they're pivoting to for value-based purchasing, right? They're pivoting to the GG items, 
But what do you see MedPAC looking at? What is their lens that they look at when they recommend these cuts? Yeah, so if you read like deep into their report, right, they publish a chapter every year, like that's on these different post-acute care settings. And a lot of it is trends and use over time and how many beneficiaries use and what's the average cost of an episode. One of the other things they look at is like finances of an agency, right? They look at operating margin, but they look at operating margin for the most part on the basis of Medicare payments, right? So what is that agency, you know, the cost that is on their cost reports and all the things that they have to submit. Um, and that's not my area of expertise, but I do kind of like glance through these reports. And then they say that agency payments tend to outweigh the cost by a margin, like eight, nine, ten percent. They don't quote me on the actual number, but you know, they and then they say that this is sufficient, it's increasing, it's, you know, people are making more money. But then we have agencies who do other things like treat home-based outpatient care, right? That might be extending care to people who might not get it. That doesn't really show up in their cost report, but they probably lose money doing that, extending care. Providing service to VA or Medicaid home and community-based waiver services or the increasing proportion of Medicare Advantage who pays a capitated per visit rate that's often not really reflective of cost of giving care. The administrative burden of dealing with, you know, all of that to get prior authorizations and submit, you know, claims two or three times, right? Those are all the costs that are hard to hard to measure because we don't have good numbers on that. But so I think MedPAC often looks at these payments as paying you know, more than it costs to provide care for these beneficiaries. The agencies are making plenty of money, so we can we can cut these payments because you know there's not a clear value proposition, right? And so they use data. They have a process. They have some legislatively required language that they have to use to evaluate these things. But I don't often think it tells the full picture, and which is why I think advocacy is important, right? Because you guys have numbers for these things. You know, your your agency partners have numbers, and sometimes the pressure can't just come from people who have financial interests. It's got to come from patients and care partners, and like this is a service that we rely on. We, you know. Imagine MS Association or Alzheimer's Association, like writing letters on your behalf and like, what would we do without these services? Or these are invaluable for, for our members or for people we advocate for, for their care partners, right? We have zero measures of, on the OASIS of care partner health, right? How many hours of caregiving does that person have to provide? What's their health like? What's their burden like? maybe we're moving the needle really on caregiver burden. Maybe we're setting up resources and that caregiver instead of four hours of care a day only has to provide two, right? There's so much indirect cost to the system. We have zero way to measure that. So these are all things that I would really care about measuring at some point um, if I had a chance with, you know, millions of dollars to, to run a study. And, and Jason, I think part of the issue is that these functional questions, I, I think they've outlived their usefulness. I mean, they're basically exactly the same as they were 20 plus years ago when it's all started. There's no evolution of those questions because what the ones that they've overlapped for the star ratings here are the same ones that they kept for payment. And so if you start changing the question, you affect how payment is calculated. So these have basically been untouched for over two decades. And it's like our whole setting has evolved, what we can provide in the home has evolved. All these things have moved on and, and people like yourself thinking about caregiver burden and number of hours and all this other. And, and we're still looking at questions that are just old. And every time it, you know, we're gonna get Oasis E, yeah, you added some interesting things around social determinants of health and all, but you kept the measures still about these ancient questions that have had no decent modification in 20 years. So it's kind of like, what point do you have to say, yes, we're going to maybe divest quality in the terms of stars out of using the same questions that are payment calculations. And maybe the time has come to just reboot what you're measuring for quality and mm -hmm. not keep going off the old ones. But one thing I noticed in that study, Jason, and I want to touch on before we're done today, 
Cindy, there was the focus. Let me ask that question. Let me let me jump in real quick and, and add something to what he just finished with because I know what your next question will be. Um, is I wanted to follow up with the most people most agencies' cost reports are due tomorrow. And we know as a as an industry, since the implementation of OASIS um, in tw in the year 2000, 2001, um, we do not do our cost reports the same as we did before. Before, a lot of our fee for service rates were set on our cost reports based on what our expenditures were building wise to rent to everything. And since P since the implementation of PPS, a lot of folks said, well, cost reports don't matter. We're going to get paid the same thing anyway. Well, yeah, they matter because they show what kind of profit you're making and they set the numbers for the um, med pack. And then with the implementation of, of Medicare Advantage data, they just finished with a comment period for CMS yesterday. And I encourage everyone to go and read the comments because I'm going to tell you in the South, we call ripping them a new one. And a lot of the providers and a lot of the stakeholders ripped the Medicare advantages, a deserved new one. And it's going to be interesting and everybody needs to stay tuned to what's going to happen to Medicare advantage in home health, particularly skilled nursing as well. Now that we've tipped over that 50% mark, as far as the number of people on those programs, how CMS is going to regulate that is going to be super interesting. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of jump in there and say, guys, your first of all, your cost reports tomorrow, make sure it's accurate. Second of all, go look at those, that information. Cindy, I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go no, ahead. no, no. Because that's been a longstanding, you know, we get told that we have to get a pay cut because margins are too high. Yeah. And using cost report data that we then say, oh, I didn't fill it out right or it didn't really match. So mm -hmm. it's, it's garbage in, garbage out in terms of, you know, being able to say, no, that's not accurate. But those are the cost reports you did submit to CMS. So there is there's is an option on their side. I mean, I can see where they're going to choose that that was accurate information. I mean, it, it should have been. Yeah. But what I, what I want to touch on, Jason, was in that same JAMA study was a look at initiation of care mm -hmm. and how over that time period, it got a little bit longer to start, longer to start, longer to start. And I know you've done some, some look at that phenomenon around initiation of care. So what are your thoughts on that part of the article? Yeah, I mean, initiation of care measures, I really struggle with what to do with those because some agencies, you know, can manipulate those, right? You can, you're gonna start, you get a eval on a Friday evening and you call the patient and like, you know, you got this referral, but like, wouldn't you rather start on Monday? And like, is it okay if you don't write? And then that the agency writes the, so the physician, the physician puts in a new start of care order for Monday. And then you go out Monday and look at you, you started same day as the referral, you're amazing. But really that patient's physiological vulnerability, you didn't just pause the clock on um, that three days. So, right, so the metric is kind of disconnected from the underlying like physiological principle. Um, so I don't like it and agencies that game it, game it well. And then there's agencies who just don't care to game it that are really, really good in providing care. And, you know, they're not gonna game the system or they'd rather spend their energy instead of writing a million new referrals to the doctors just to meet the metric, they'd rather Take the take the one day hit and you know invest that energy instead in getting information from the doctors and the hospital and providing really high quality care. So timely initiation of care is I don't like to say garbage in garbage out because we we do want to like get people out there quickly and there is you know some urgency in getting people you know started with care especially after hospitalization or post acute care, but. I give the scenario of my dad and I talk about this all the time. Probably you've probably heard this story before. My dad lived in very deeply rural Maine and he had, he had a pathological fracture in his early twenties and had multiple like hip revisions, botched surgeries, like, you know, not a lot of great healthcare provided to him. And at one point he had revision surgery, infection and in hip, like needed to get discharged to a home health agency. At this point he was living in, rural Maine and, you know, but he was really just like very mobility impaired and PT was the only service he really needed. So he gets discharged, the nurse comes out and sees him within 48 hours and says, well, the physical therapist, there's only one and it's covering this whole county. So they'll be here in a couple of weeks. So here's, here's my phone number and call me. So technically, 
initiate a timely initiation of care, but was it timely initiation and providing the appropriate intensity of care in the early part when he was most vulnerable? No, no, definitely not. To the agency, no problem. But the actual quality of care, not what he needed, right? Like, you know, the mobility limited, high risk for DVT after major revision orthopedic surgery with a lot of other medical comorbidities, you know, pneumonia risk, which he did get, um, you know, so like all the things that are very preventable, but that agency by Medicare's definition provided high quality, timely home health care. So, you know, I, I don't really consider that metric anything except for something that agencies, you know, actively try to manipulate to look good. Like the agencies that prioritize it, they prioritize it for the medical and physiological reasons. They want to keep people out of the hospital. It's part of their care pathways. They have a good way to stratify people. I don't want to discount the value, but the metric in and of itself just doesn't tell us what we think it's telling us. So I don't, I don't put much stock in it to be honest. But Medicare has to, right? They're, they're legislatively required because it's literally in their legal obligations to put these things together and create these ratings and. You know, it's congressionally mandated for, for some of this to be developed. So their hands are kind of tied. But what we do with that data and how, you know, how we prioritize it in terms of other things that we want to you know, do in terms of providing good care, I just that that metric doesn't really resonate that much. One percent change also like uh, of an absolute magnitude is kind of like, you know, statistical noise to me. You know very minor i wouldn't you know I, I it doesn't concern me as much as some of the other stuff i'll say that but well, what i want to interject before you ask your question jerry is we did a different podcast about initiation of care and all i've got to say is how did all three of us end up with family members not getting the proper level of home care i mean in three different states three different circumstances three different time frames and yet it goes right back to not being initiated appropriately, not taking care of what things to be, need to be taken care of. And you go, we, we know what the expectation is. We should get this level of care. What happens to the majority of, of home health patients that don't have a knowledgeable caregiver that just go, oh, two weeks, well, a poor PT, they're driving all over the place. It's going to take a while. I understand. And it's like, but it, it's still wrong. And how did we go 0 for 3 in, in this situation? It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, and, and, you know, when we look at this kind of stuff, it, like like Jason's saying, we have to look at it in the in the lens that it's brought to us. Right. So this is a this is a pre PDGM. This is not the environment we're currently living in. This was during PPS, towards the end of PPS, when the, when the uh, value-based purchase, or not value-based purchasing, but the STARS program started in 2015. Jason, what do you think going forward? Let's look look at what is still the past, but looking from 2020 to say the end of 2023, since we're in 2024, what would you expect would change about some of these outcomes post PDGM? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So I don't think that because the outcomes are still driving payment, I honestly don't see, you know, a lot of different trends like the ones that drive payment are going to improve a lot um you know even if we go to mostly claims-based measures which are you know kind of what some of the suggestions have been there's ways to game those too so i have worked in an agency or collaborated with an agency i won't say where but literally the coaching for all of us who are you know doing oasis opens or you know routinely seeing patients on weekends were try to get people that are hospitalized like you know and they come out and they're getting home care if they need something try to get them transferred to a skilled nursing facility versus getting them re-hospitalized right like if they need something call the call everybody you can try to pull the levers and see if they can directly admit them to SNF within 30 days of their hospital discharge which can happen and that's failed care that, you know, really is like that person wasn't successful at home and wasn't medically stable. And instead of a readmission, they go to SNP, which doesn't count as a readmission. And when Medicare looks at it, that's not an unplanned readmission. That's a you know transfer to SNP or a delayed discharge to SNP, which doesn't count against the metrics, mm -hmm. right? Or they have community paramedic services on staff to try to keep people from going to the emergency room, right? So they, they create structures to try to like, reduce 
hospital utilization. And some of that's appropriate. I don't want to say overwhelmingly it's not, but it's like literally coached, like try this first, no matter the situation, unless it's like, you know, the person's like actively bleeding in front of you or having a stroke, right? Like, and, and so there's ways to game whatever metric you decide. I don't expect the metrics to change a lot. But what I do expect is if we went in and measured these patients, we are doing a much better job providing patient-centered care. Like, I think home health care just in general, do a really good job of meeting patients and families where they are, meeting those needs, something that we're really good at that's not measured anywhere. And I think we're more and more aligned with patient priorities um, as we provide this care. Um, and we're more efficient, right? As PTs, you know, a lot of times we didn't need 10 or 13 visits to, to work with somebody. You know, 13 was a magic number for a long time to to get to a certain agency payment threshold, right? 13, 14 visits. But now like four to six visits where the payment doesn't you know, depend on you, you can space things out a little bit and do a really, you know, do a really good job um, in less visits and be more efficient. Um, I think that's a good thing. But overall, I, I don't expect a whole lot of changes. I think health system is gonna follow the metrics and the metrics are consistently, you know, going to be disconnected from people's underlying priorities and health um, if they're not refined, like, like uh, Cindy says. Like, I just think we're measuring the wrong things. I, I'm interested to see the timely initiation of care during the pandemic years. I think that some of the waivers that were in place that allowed the, the discipline that was most necessary to get into the home first allowed for possibly a better initiation of care, but then the disease kind of delayed you depending on what the status of the patient was. So it to me is going to be interesting. And I know that there's always going to be an asterisk, kind of like baseball stats, right? There's going to be an asterisk that says these were the pandemic years. And, and right now I think that's considered uh, March 2020 to December 23 is the pandemic year. So I think as we go into VPP in 2025, as we as we start making payment changes, those those next years are going to be the interesting ones. And and Utilization of technology. I think the the new technologies are going to improve where you may not have to go visit the patient 13 times, but you may have 13 touches, mixing yeah. in your telehealth, mixing in your telephonic, all the things that you can do to facilitate a patient in improving in real ways. I mean, there's obviously remote patient monitoring and outpatient now. There's there's all kinds of things that you can do. So I would encourage people to read these kinds of studies when they happen but more so read the ones that spring off of this one. I think that when we when we look at this one, it's gonna be quoted a lot in a lot of research going forward. And, and I, you know, as far as a reference, I think that they're gonna use this as a, as a framework. Hey, I'm gonna take this piece and study this part that I thought was a little bit off or something like that. But Jason, we could not have this conversation without you. And I, and I think I wanna let our listeners know that today is Jason's birthday. And the fact that we we stole this expert on his birthday and he willingly joined us on his birthday says something about the level of dedication you've had as a professional to the home health post acute space. I think that, you know, again, this is his Twitter handle. Please take a moment and follow him on Twitter. It, you won't regret it. Um, not only is he a great researcher and a, and a brilliant mind, but he's also kind of funny. You got you, you got some funny content, Jason. I'm not I'm not going to lie. So any, Cindy, do you have anything else to follow up? No, I just think it's important to look at, at research. I think sometimes we get very stuck in how things are now and staffing shortages and, and Oasis education and coding work and all this other that you, you do need to look at the big picture. And, mm -hmm. and I think to get the change you're talking about, Jason, of different measures and, and what the patients value requires us to be engaged in that kind of thinking and discussion as well. If we don't like how it is now, we need to be part of how it changes going forward. So when Oasis E hit and these questions around isolation and that, that I'm sure would be a discussion for another day about how good of a measure some of these are. But this whole, oh no, now we got to ask them about this. You, you didn't care about transportation and isolation before. So that's interesting. But but what are you doing with that measure? Not just putting down something and I make sure I follow the directions and answer it. But if you find individuals with these issues, how are you incorporating that in a plan of care? I, I just want us to be part of the change because I think when it comes to star ratings, there's a lot of hand wringing and it's rigged against me. And yeah, it's broken. It, it's not ideal. 
but it's not going to change if we just keep practicing to the test and not being willing to look at what are other options? What am I really doing care wise? Not just if I got, you know, X number of stars, then my agency is fabulous and there's nothing else for us to work on. Yep. I, I think uh, don't be scared to innovate, like partner with people, create, you know, opportunities to study something. If you think something is that you're doing is really effective and you have a great care pathway, please call people like me or other research and say, can you help us test this? And measure it and provide us data to bring back and say, you know, this is part of our advocacy. Um, because star ratings are just virtue signaling for the most part, right? It's like the agencies that, that care about the star ratings will make their star ratings better. But sometimes that's disconnected from the quality of care. Sometimes it's not, but sometimes it is. And I think you've got to really market like that kind of data that you have might not resonate directly with Medicare, but you know who's gonna resonate with is people in your community, your partners, your patients who are gonna to demand to come to your agency because you're doing cool things. And the health systems are gonna be like, wow, they're partnering and doing innovative things or doing research or partnering with our researchers. And now we wanna send more people there because we, we've worked with them. We know their reputation is great. They're three and a half stars, but they're really providing better care than the five star agencies in our area. So make sure that you market your value outside of star ratings, right? Jason, thank you. I just can't thank you enough. And thank you for being a friend of K&K. &K. And, and again, take the opportunity to follow Jason, subscribe to our YouTube channel where this will be housed and free for everyone to listen to. And I hope that um, you enjoy the content and let us know if there's anything else you're interested in. Um, if, if we have nothing else, I'm going to say goodbye to everyone and thank you for listening and please be safe out there. <laughs>